greater capacity and show up in a greater way in our lives, Lord. And I, I ask, Lord God, that as we give, Lord, back to you, that it would honor you, that it would please you, that, Lord, our worship today would be as a pleasing aroma unto you. And I ask these things in your precious name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team, don't move too far. I want you to turn your Bibles to Ruth, Ruth chapter 1. We're going to start in Ruth chapter 1. and I'm going to talk about Naomi and Ruth. I'm going to be a little bit more laid back since it's a little smaller crowd today. And I just sense what God wants to do in a little different way. And so uh, I'll get comfortable with you. And uh, I want to talk about the moments when we want something to happen. We want God to do th- do some great things. Um, in Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 19, it says this. So the two of them, meaning Ruth and Naomi, and I'll explain to those of you who have no idea who Ruth and Naomi are, I'll explain them to you in just a moment. It says, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me? since I am a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. The book of Ruth is this beautiful story. It's a love story. It's a, a, an incredible book of the Bible. It's only four chapters long, but it's, 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 it's got a lot in it, a lot that we could teach on, a lot that we can learn from. And uh, a lot of people like it because it's this beautiful redemption story. It's interesting that this is uh, one of the few books in the Bible, maybe the only book in the Bible, that is told from the woman's perspective. And, uh, and in Ruth is, is this, these two women, Naomi and Ruth. In chapter 1, we are introduced to Naomi. Naomi is married She has two sons in the beginning of chapter 1. They lived in Bethlehem, but a famine hits that area, and Naomi's husband decides to move the family to Moab with hopes of a better future. Time goes by, and he and both of his sons eventually die. Naomi's sons had married Moabite women, and one one of those women was Ruth. 
Naomi hears that the Lord has blessed her homeland, Bethlehem, with food, so she leaves Moab to go back home. She tells her daughter-in-laws to stay in Moab so they can remarry and rebuild and make better lives. She blesses them in the name of the Lord, and one stays, but Ruth, the Moabite, will not leave Naomi. Ruth pledges her life to Naomi and to Naomi's God, to the Lord. Naomi's once full life is now empty. Her once hopeful heart is now bitter. She left Bethlehem with her husband and sons with hope. She now returns with Ruth as a poor widow. And Ruth is just as poor as her. And Ruth is a widow as well. And the two don't have anything but each other. But there is something that Ruth has that is going to be key to their comeback. Naomi didn't see it because it wasn't tangible wealth. It wasn't a position of power. What Ruth had was very different from anything that the world would view as a way to uh, 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 succeed. What she had was humility. I believe that whether your 2019 was like Naomi's, whether you came in today and you entered 2020, looking back over 2019, and maybe you looked at it like Naomi did, and you're looking at it as a sense of loss, or you're looking at it at a sense of defeat, or you feel like 2019 was more filled with uh, maybe things that were depressing, um, or you viewed 2019 as great success. You may have looked at 2019 and said it was a great year. It was an amazing year. Some great things happened in 2019. There were promotions. There were, there were uh, privileges that I received. There were opportunities that I was able to, to take hold of. And, and it was a great year. 2019 was this an amazing year. I came out more ahead than I was the year before. And, and, and regardless of how 2019 was, humility is going to be essential for 2020. Humility is essential. I, I, we live in a very commercialized society. We live in a society that knows that you just entered a brand new year. You realize that there are so many companies right now that have inv- inventions, they have products that are just waiting in the wings for a certain moment in 2020 when they're going to be released. You know that there are companies like Apple and Chrysler and car dealerships all over and and they have inventions already ready to go but they're keeping them hidden until the right moment when they're going to release them. And you know when that moment is? It's the moment when they're going to sell to you that the product you currently hold in your pocket or you're driving right now is too old, too slow, come on, and it's become too clunky or junky or whatever. And they're going to sell you on that. And they're going to say, the product we gave you last year, it was good, but it's gotten old. Man, you got to get something new, something fresh for 2020. And once you know it, we got just the thing. Oh, it's slick. It's fast. You're going to like it. It's flashy. And then they're going to present it to you, and they're going to make these commercials, and they're going to make, and what's going to happen is you're going to need that new thing. You're going to need that upgrade. It's not, no longer going to be a want. It's going to be a need. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need this. I, I, I need this. It's, it, it, it's true. My old phone is too slow. I can't. I, it doesn't have enough data for me to make a phone call, send a text, or FaceTime. It doesn't have enough for me to get on Facebook, because after all, isn't that truly what our phones are used for? Is that, there's not enough there. My camera really isn't good enough because this is what I need to make a living because we're all professional photographers these days and nobody prints their pictures anyways and it is thousands of pictures on my phone that nobody's probably ever gonna look at but I need it I need new I need better I need flashier I need faster I need sleeker and so what we are convinced of when we need new is that we will take out a small mortgage 
to put these phones in our teenagers' pockets and to drive these new cars that we so desperately needed so that the car can tell us what to do and when we need to do it and the phone can do the same and everything can alert because we need it we need it right because we need these upgrades and these promotions but you know what in the kingdom of God God is clear that promotion and upgrade comes from one thing humility humility is God's upgrade he doesn't he doesn't try and put something flashy in front of you he doesn't try and and make it look colorful and and, and more attractive in fact it's the opposite of that in the kingdom of God God puts something in front of you and he says if you want an upgrade if you want a promotion then don't do the flashy thing don't do the thing that looks like it's a, a, a better position or puts you on a better platform. He puts this thing out in front of us and he says, if you want promotion in 2020, if you want an upgrade in 2020, here's how you're going to get it. It's through humility. Matthew 23, 12 says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be a Exalted. Matthew 18, 3 through 4 says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Proverbs 22, 4 says, The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Like so many things in the kingdom of heaven, they are achieved the opposite of the world. The natural human inclination to achieve, achieve success or promotion or upgrades or victory or a comeback from 2019 is to think that I need, in order to get that, in order to be there, I'm going to need to achieve power, authority, praise, or position. And we think with those things will come success and victory and promotion and upgrades. And so we begin to pursue or we begin to strive to make something happen with our strength as we pursue power, authority, praise, position. We can throw in some other things, wealth, money, friends, influence, a lot of different things. And none of those things are bad. Hear me out, none of those things are bad. All of them are worthy accomplishments when achieved the right way. But before the end of chapter 4 of the book of Ruth, we're going to see Naomi and Ruth, they achieve these things. They achieve position. They achieve some wealth. They achieve praise from the people. They uh, uh, achieve even some authority. It, it's going to come to them. None of those things are bad. But it's how scripture tells us to get there that's key. The key is getting there the right way, God's way. You see, their comeback started with humility. Ruth was a humble woman. When she arrived in Bethlehem, the Bible tells us she was a widow, she was poor, and she was serving her mother-in-law in a country that was not her own. Several times in the first two chapters, she is called the Moabite. That isn't because it was a title that she could wear with honor. She was referenced as a Moabite woman to make it clear to those in Bethlehem that she was a foreigner. She didn't belong as one of them. These titles were not signs of success in her society, and, and they wouldn't have been signs of success in our society either, which would make us think that she was humble because she was weak and insecure. We would tend to think, well, Ruth was humble because life had left her without the security of income. Ruth was humble because she didn't have a spouse to help her. Ruth was humble because she didn't have a position of influence. Ruth was humble because life had left her in a weaker position or a status, a weaker status in society. But can I tell you something? You can be in a humble state in life and still not have humility. You can be in a humble state and still have pride. Welcome to America. You can still be puffed up and be living in poverty. You can be humbled and not choose to live humbly. Just because you've been humble doesn't mean you have humility. 
We live in a world where we believe, hey, I deserve it. I deserve it. And, and, and people can be lazy. They can be bums. Let's just call it what it is. And they can say that. And, and they have no humility. And they stand with their hand out saying, I deserve it. And yet they find themselves in a humble position. But they don't walk in humility. Ruth wasn't humble because of her position or her status in life. I believe that Ruth walked in humility. She was a person that just simply was humble. She was humble. Matthew 23, 12 says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Ruth chose to walk in humility. She chose to do it. We know that she chose to stay with her mother-in-law. She chose to go to the fields and work. She chose to do those things because she was humble, not because life had put her in that situation. She chose to stay in Bethlehem, even though it would mean that she would be a foreigner who would have to work as a poor person to survive. She did it to serve Naomi, which shows me the first thing about being a person of humility. People with humility have an honest perspective of who they really are. According to the dictionary, humility, humility is an honest or low view of one's own importance. If I'm honest, it's hard to even share that definition in our culture and society today. We want people to view themselves from the perspective that they are worthy, great, better than they think, right? We want people to take this view with hopes that they will raise the bar in their life. We promote people. We lift up people. That's a good thing. It's, it's not a bad thing. We want to encourage others. We want to promote other people. We want to raise the bar in their thinking. We want to inspire others. But when it comes to ourselves, look at what Philippians tells us. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, what humility does is it helps us keep the healthy perspective that says, I'm a servant of God, and I'm a servant of others. That's what I am. No matter the position, no matter the power, no matter the praise that I receive or have, I understand my importance, and I have a healthy view of who I really am. Humility says I understand my position under God and my purpose to serve Him and others. It says I'm comfortable and content with serving those around me because I understand that I'm a servant of God. Humility says I understand my place in the body. I'm under Jesus and I'm serving others. The key is to remember that apart from Christ I can do nothing but that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's, it, it's this catch that, that even though I look at my life and I evaluate my life and I'm humble enough to realize that really without Christ, uh, I, I'm not good. I would go as far as to say I'm scum because I have sin in my life and I'm, and, and I'm not worthy, like we sang before, of his love. I haven't deserved it. I haven't earned it. I, I, I'm, I'm nobody. But because of Christ, I am somebody. Because of what Christ did for me and because of my position as a son of God, I, I am somebody and I'm worthy of a cause. And, 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 but I recognize that without Christ, yes. I'm nothing. It's Christ that, that gives me everything. It's Christ that gives me value. It's Christ that makes me worth it. It's Christ. It's Him. And I recognize that. And humility honors that and says, because of Christ, because of Christ, I'm a servant to all. It's humility. It's humility. 
You know, I'm under Jesus and I'm serving others. Dr. Frank Cranes defines humility as this. It says, it is the wish to be great and the dread of being called great. It is the wish to help and the dread of thanks. It is the love of service and the distaste for rule. It is trying to be good and blushing when caught at it. When Naomi was trying to convince Ruth to go back to Moab, Ruth responded to Naomi with this. She said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death departs departs me from you. The Bible says that Naomi saw that Ruth was determined. You see, Ruth wasn't humble because of her circumstance. Ruth walked in humility because she was determined. She was determined to serve. And she wasn't just serving Naomi, but she makes a statement. She says, your God will be my God. I'm going to serve your God. I'm going to do life your way. I'm going to do this and I'm going to serve you. Because Ruth was a person of humility. And we must see that humility is a choice. And we must be determined enough to choose it. Because understand what God says. God says that if you don't make it your choice, you will be humbled. You try and exalt yourself. You try and do it the world's way. You try and work. You try and strive for it. You try and make yeah, that those, the, the way to exalt yourself. He says, you try and do that, you will be humbled. He humbles you. He takes you down a notch. But in the kingdom, he says, if you just simply humble yourself, let me do the exalting. Watch this, because the fear that most have of choosing humility is that it will be viewed as weak and vulnerable. See, that's the thought. Why? Because the definition in our dictionary tells us that, hey, it's a, it's a low view of oneself. And so we look at ourselves and we think, hey, I got to hang my head. I, if I'm going to be humble, I got to hang my head. I got to be weak. I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, look, look like I'm a strong person. It, but, but the thought is this, if people really see me for who I really am and I'm humble enough to serve them, then they will take advantage of me. And so people veer away from humility but in the kingdom of heaven humility isn't weakness or insecurity in fact it's viewed in the exact opposite way it's a reflection of true strength and confidence it, 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 this is the second thing about humility humility brings God's protection that's strength the third thing is humility brings God's provision that's confidence I have a confidence that I'm going to be taken care of when I walk in humility. Psalms 149.4 says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. When you walk in humility, God takes responsibility for your protection and your provision. Why is it that we think that we're going to be so weak? When God is for us, who can be against us? I'm no longer weak. I'm the strongest I've ever been when I walk in humility. I've never been stronger. When I am weak, he is strong. You've never been stronger when you see God. When you see God move, I'm telling you, you have not seen something stronger than him. He is strong. He is mighty. He is able, the Bible says. Ruth knew who she was. She served Naomi with humility, but when arriving in Bethlehem, she didn't come with a haughty or proud spirit. She didn't come looking for a handout because she was Naomi's daughter-in-law. She came ready to work as what? As a poor person. She came walking in humility. She was confident enough to serve Naomi and had the strength to do what it took to accomplish that task. And look how God stepped up in response to her humility. The Bible says she went to the fields to glean. This was the common amongst the poor in her day. What the poor would do during the times of harvest is they would go to the fields and they would follow the men who were called the reapers. And as they were reaping the harvest, they would follow behind them with hopes that they could glean some of the leftovers, some of the, some of the crop that fell to the wayside. And they would collect it and, and they would gather it. And she happens, the Bible says, she happens. Somebody say, it just happened. It just happened. She happens to go to the field of Boaz. How did you get that promotion? Well, it just happened. 
How did you get so lucky? I, I don't know. It just happened. Have you ever looked at someone who didn't seem to have the skills, the talent, the charisma to get what they have and to be where they are? They just always seem to be working in the background. They don't stand out to you, but somehow, some way, they just happen to get where they are. They just happen to be there. They just happen. They don't look like it. They don't act like it. They don't fall on it. And then you figure out they just happen to be rich. And you go, they just don't, I don't, I, I, they don't seem like the type of person I would think that would have all that money. They don't, they, they don't, they just seem to happen to have, how did they get that? How did that happen? They don't have much of the stuff that you think would make you happy, but they just happen to have joy. Well, how come they always just seem to be happy? It's just every time I get around that person, they just happen to have joy. They just happen to have peace. They just happen to have a great marriage. They just happen to have great friends. They just happen. It just seems like they always just have, they don't even seem to strive for it or to work for it or to promote themselves or look for time. It just seems to happen with them. How come it just happens? It just happens. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to both. It's ironic that the author used those words because we all know that God was orchestrating where Ruth would be that day. It didn't just happen. She went to the field of Boaz, who was a good and God-fearing man. The reason she happened to be there is because God is a God who provides for and protects the humble. The reason the poor were in this field is because Boaz abided by God's law found in Leviticus chapter 19. In verse 9 it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edges. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Ruth was humble enough to realize she needed to work to find her provision. And it was there that she found her protection as well as her provision. She didn't demand or beg for what she felt was rightfully hers. She showed up and she worked for it. And Boaz men took notice of her. The reapers took notice of her. And I'm sure it was more than just her good looks that they noticed. Because when Boaz shows up, he says, who is, who is this woman? Who's this woman that's, that's now all of a sudden with, with the poor, that's reaping and gleaning, in, or that's gleaning in our fields? Who, who is this woman? And one of the men said, ah, you know, she came in early this morning. This one, she showed up early this morning, and she's been working hard ever since she showed up. And she only took one short break. And, and, and Boaz, she's that foreigner. She's that Moabite woman. She's, she's, she's poor because she's a widow. And, and, and she chose to serve Naomi. And that's why she's here, because she came with Naomi. You know the one who's now a widow, the one who's poor. See, it didn't just happen that Boaz took notice of her. It happened because she showed up. It happened because she was humble servant to Naomi. It happened because she was humble enough not to sleep in, humble enough to work with the poor, humble enough to work hard for very little, humble enough to do her part. Is anybody hearing me? It's happened because she was humble. Sometimes you got to understand that you're not going to get that management position or that promotion unless you're humble enough to start with cleaning the toilets. I didn't start on this platform. I started cleaning toilets. Mopping floors, cutting bushes, working any position in the church that they said, hey, we got something for you. And I said, awesome, sign me up. The more I can be there, the better. And it started there. It doesn't stop at the platform either. This morning, 6.30 this morning, I'm texting the guys, seeing if the roads are good. Got in my car, drove here, shoveled a few walks, met Dave Murray. He showed up and we did some things. It doesn't stop with the platform. There's things that happen behind the scenes that are necessary for the promotion. They're necessary. Now, now I will say this. When I was in my youth pastor days and I told people that I was getting what we might call a promotion, the title of lead pastor, you know what my youth pastor friends said? They said, oh, we're sorry that you've been demoted. You know why? Because when you understand the kingdom, you understand that every time you get promoted, the cost of ministry just went up. 
the cost of ministry just went up. More people to serve, more ways to serve, more problems to serve. Come on. It's, it, it's, it's there. It's that position of humility. Anytime you look at somebody that has greater success than you or greater responsibility than you, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Young person, you're looking at your parents and you're looking at your older brothers and sisters and you're looking at the 21-year-old and 22-year-old that's on their own and you're thinking, I just cannot wait to get out of high school. I cannot wait to get out of this place where I have to do homework and I have to wake up early and I have this responsibility to take a test and I cannot wait till I'm free till you get there. Then you realize... I still got to get up early. And if I don't get up early, nobody's feeding me. Nobody's making my bed anymore. Nobody's vacuuming my floor anymore. Nobody's putting gas in my car anymore. What happened? What happened? You've been humbled. You just got humbled. And the the Chapel Lake people are like, you know it. You know it. Because I was there. We've all been there. When we're in high school, we can't wait to get out of there. And five years after high school, we're like, I would give anything to do my senior year over again. I would give anything to do that again. Homework is no problem. I would love to do some more. I would love to go home and show up to some home-cooked meal on the table and not have to work for it. What was I thinking not wanting to do the dishes? Oh my goodness, my dad was good. I should have washed the car every weekend. Maybe he would have filled the tank more often. We've been humbled and all of a sudden we realize, man, my pride was burning great moments in my life. I don't want to miss the moment because of my pride. I want to humble myself enough to realize the blessings that are around me and humble myself enough to realize that ultimately it's all God's anyways. It's all God's anyways, and I'm just blessed to be a part of it. Boaz told Ruth, look at what he says when she says to him, she, she, she notices that Boaz takes, takes uh, notice of her, and, and he begins to give her favor in the field. And uh, it's not just because, uh, um, you know, he, he, he was just a nice guy. It is because he does like her. But, um, but this is a God arrangement. Said God arrangement. And she says, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? In other words, why is this happening? Why is this ha- why are you showing favor to me? And Boaz told her this. He said, The Lord repay you for what you have done. A full reward for given be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth is in his field. Ruth is gleaning his crops. Ruth is eating his food. Ruth is being blessed by him. Ruth is finding provision and protection from Boaz. But Boaz doesn't see it that way. Because Ruth isn't the only humble person in the story. Boaz knows his place and he knows who he serves. He has enough humility to recognize, like all humble believers, that everything is the Lord's and I'm just his humble servant. He realizes all the people in my life are God's. All the stuff in this life is his. Boaz knew he was a manager of the true king's stuff. He was called to serve and obey God, and because he was humble, it just so happened that Boaz had great favor with God and man. When Boaz happened to come to the fields, you don't see him coming as an arrogant, puffed-up man full of pride. It says on arriving to the scene, he says to the people, be blessed. And the people respond back to him, you be blessed also. He, he, he comes. He's, he's, this, is why, this is why women like to read the story of Ruth, because they like this guy. He, he, he not only has influence, and he not only has money, and he not only has property, and he, he, but he's not an arrogant, prideful, puffed-up guy. He's the type of guy that's humble. He's the type of guy that comes looking to see how he can bless other people first. And the people respond towards him by blessing him. He is honored. He's respected. We're going to see later on in the book of Ruth that he has respect for protocol and authority. He is an honest man. He is a man of humility. It's no wonder that God would choose Boaz and Ruth to be the great-grandparents of King David. 
David would come from humble beginnings, humility. It just so happened that way. How many of you want some things to just start happening? Some things to just start lining up in your life. Some God to start doing some things and you to just be like, wow, that just kind of happened. That just kind of happened. Look, look what happened in my marriage. Look what happened my sophomore year. Look what happened in school. Look what happened at work. Look what happened with our finances. Look what happened with our kids. Look what happened with mom and dad. Look what happened. I, I want to be able to say that at the end of 2020. Look what happened. Look at all these things that happened. Can you believe that happened? I can't believe that happened at work. I wasn't even trying to make that happen. I wasn't even looking for that promotion. It just kind of happened. I want to see things happen in my life. And I think you want to see things happen in your life. And I want to see things happen happen in our church. And in order to see things happen, we have to understand that we got to walk in humility. Humility is the access point. It's, it's viewing ourselves appropriately. I am a servant of Jesus and I'm serving others. It's this reality that my access point to God's protection and God's provision comes through humility. First Peter 5, and this is where I'm going to close and ask the worship team to come. And this is where we're going to take a posture of humility before God and allow something great to happen. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. says, Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever amen you know wouldn't it have been great if somehow Naomi could have got a hold of this passage of scripture wouldn't it have been awesome if, if, if when she, she was in Moab and her, her husband had died and her two boys had died and she didn't have any way to make money and she had no way to feed her family and, and, and she was choosing to go back to Bethlehem and she's uh, arriving in Bethlehem and she's wondering how in the world am I going to get through and, and what am I going to do and, and, and when the people welcome her back in Bethlehem they begin to embrace her and, and, and she finds herself bitter and broken and hurting and wondering you know how how, how am I going to make it, let alone, you know, where's my upgrade, where's my promotion coming from? Wouldn't it have been awesome if somehow she could have got a hold of this scripture? Wouldn't it have been awesome if somehow she could, she could have embraced this, this truth and been able to hold to it and been able to say, you know what, the enemy's done some damage in my life, he's, he's, he's roamed around, he's, he's taken some things from me, he's stolen from me, he, he's caused some death and destruction in my life, but you know what, I'm going to hold to the truth that, that God is a redeeming God, that God is a God that comes and he redeems things because she didn't know the end of the story, she didn't know that that. that by the end of her life that the woman would say to her blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him you see that's the cool thing about God is anytime the enemy comes and he steals from our lives if we trust God if we trust God, if we humble ourselves before God, if we're willing to surrender ourselves before God, God just doesn't redeem. God redeems seven times. 
over. God restores. He brings it back over and over and over again. And we don't always see how it's going to come. You know, in her culture, in her day, the only way she thought that could be redeemed was through a son. In fact, when, when, when Naomi uh, was talking to Ruth and, and her other daughter-in-law and telling them, stay in Moab, stay in Moab, she said to them, what hope do you have with me? There is no hope. She says, I'm so old. Do you think that I'm going to somehow find a husband? in my old age and and somehow I'm going to have a son and are you really going to wait for that son to grow up so you can marry him? He is our only hope. The boy is our only hope. And what she didn't know is that there was going to be somebody in her life and it wasn't going to be a man. It was going to be a woman who would humble herself who would say, I'm poor, I'm a foreigner, but I will humble myself and act as a servant. And when she humbled herself She was access to the Redeemer. Now that's the thing about God. You want God to move, you can strive and you can push and you can try and prove God that you're worthy of it or you can just humble yourself before Him. And when you humble yourself before God, He is your Redeemer. He does come. That's how you take shelter under His wings. That's how you find that strength, that provision, that protection. It's how you discover the plan and the purpose that he has for your life. It's how he begins to exalt you. It's he begins to lift you out of that place. That's what Jesus does. He is the redeemer. Boaz is a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. And I hope today that you will discover humility. I hope today that we can posture ourselves before Jesus, before we close this service in such a way that allows God to allow something to happen. You know, I want something great to happen in your life. I want maybe that healing that you've been wanting. Maybe, maybe it's a healing of emotions or heart, or maybe it's, it's, a, it's a battle that you've been going through. Maybe it's, it's just looking for that next thing that God has for you. Maybe it's been a great year, and you're looking at the year ahead, and, and the temptation is, is to, to just, you know, enjoy the victories from last year and to just kind of, you know, put the badge on and say, look what I did last year. This was great. This was amazing. Can I tell you something? The moment people do that and they just begin to, you know, be proud of their successes from the year before, the moment that they do that is usually the beginning of the, the slide. You know what I'm talking about? It's a slide. It's like, man, next thing you know, they're not saying, wow, look what I did last year. They're saying, what happened? In a negative way. What happened? What, what, what happened? Things were going so good. What happened? What happened? And, and I think what happens is pride gets in the way and humility doesn't keep, you know, driving us in the right direction. You know, and for those in this room that think perhaps that, Humility is a weak thing, and, uh, and I'll speak specifically to men today. You know, the most humble, one of the most humble men I know is Dr. David Remedios, Pastor David from Louisiana. He's not a big man in stature at all. He's short. He's little. He's, uh, he's a man of great accomplishments, but he certainly doesn't flaunt them. He's a full-time pastor. He's also a heart surgeon. He, um, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that, but he's, he, he does it. He serves. People drive from all around the country just to drive him on Mondays because if you are his driver on Monday, you get to spend 13 hours with the man, 11 to 13 hours with him, and people will drive from all over the country to be his driver on Monday just to drive around, just to spend time with him. I can tell you I've been in his presence on numerous occasions and um, and the presence of God, whether he is eating a taco or whether he is ministering at the altar, the presence of God is usually too strong in the room for me to stand. I certainly can't have a conversation. I cry, I weep, I tell him and I apologize to him. I'm sorry we can't talk. He shows me corny videos and says, look at this corny video, you know, and he's laughing and I'm just, the presence of God is too strong. I can't, I can't laugh at it. Because he just, he, he just, walks with the Lord like that. My wife and I, you know, when we get around them, we say, man, I wonder if that's what it was like to be around the disciples and the apostles. But the man is incredibly humble. 
I've never t heard him talk highly of himself. I've never seen him flaunt himself. I've never seen him discipline another person publicly. I've never seen him do any of that stuff in such a way that would put him in that position. He, he, he's not the greatest preacher I've ever heard. His style, his, his way of doing it, he's not, the, uh, uh, he, he, to be honest, like even when he preaches, the, the sermons don't stick with me forever. It's not like I can tell you, oh, these were the top 10 favorite sermons I've ever heard Pastor David preach. It, it, it's not that. He, I don't think the man can sing. They don't, you know, he's not flashy, you know. He, he, he dresses nice, dresses nice. He's got nice hair, he, but he's not flashy. He's not what you would think. Oh, man, that guy's going places. His background, at one point he was homeless. You wouldn't have thought that guy's going places. Came from an abusive home. You wouldn't have thought that guy's going places. But can I tell you, there's an, uh, a group of people that follow that man everywhere. It's a group of men that would give their life in a moment for his. There's people that serve him constantly. He, uh, uh, when he is ministering, if there is a need in his life, there is somebody there like that. And he's not snapping his fingers and he's not demanding it. And he's not looking for it. It's there because this is the reason why. Because when you're in his presence, you feel like you're the most important person on planet Earth. When you're in his presence, you feel more loved than probably you ever have. When you're in his presence, he speaks so highly of you and speaks life into you. He doesn't point out all these negatives in your life. He just, he looks to you, he loves on you, he prays for you, he believes the best for you. He wants to see Jesus move in your life and his heart is broken for people. His heart is broken for people. He loves people like Jesus loves people. And so, in turn, people promote him. And people put him up there. I was just talking to Austin, who is doing an internship under him right now in Louisiana. And he was saying, you know, you get in the car with him, and you're talking, and, and he's texting on the phone, and the presence of God is strong in the car. And and, uh, and you'll say something, you'll reference a big name speaker or pastor and, and, and he'll get his phone out, shoot somebody a text and then I'll say to you, yeah, just text that guy. Just text him. He's got all these famous people on his phone. To you and I, they would be famous. To you and I, we wouldn't be able to get real close to him in ministry, but he, he knows him like a friend on his phone and just text him and not in a prideful way, but he's got all these connections. Why? Because God is making those connections happen because he's a person of humility. Can I encourage every man in this place that thinks it's weak? I think he's got more bodyguards than you. I think there's more people willing to give their lives for him than probably you. Uh, he's not weak. He's not, he's not, you know, feeble. He's not any of those things. He's incredibly strong. And how he shows it is with incredible humility. And so I tell you that because I, I, I couldn't sit up here and talk about humility. And, and one, it would be wrong to brag. But two, I don't come anywhere close to that. I don't come anywhere close to that, that man. I don't come anywhere close to the, the, being able to walk in the shoes he walks in. He, is, he has got such love. And that happened the moment he saw me, I felt that. The moment I went to Louisiana and he didn't have a clue who I was, I was just some guy visiting from Michigan. He had love for me. Every time he would walk up, he would just begin to weep and cry and pray for me. And, and there was love instantly. And I felt it and I was drawn to him and, and, and I wanted to hear what he had to say and I wanted to know what God was saying through him. And it was instant. And he does that with everybody. I pray that this is a church filled with people just like that. Humble enough to reach out. Humble enough to recognize we are servants of Jesus. And we serve others. Humble enough to recognize that our true strength, protection, and provision comes from Jesus. And we need to stay in the shelter of his wings. He is our redeemer. And if we have to glean in the field before we realize that we own the field, then so be it. So be it. 
Did you hear that? She gleaned in the field before she knew she owned it. If we got to glean as poor people before we realize that we have authority in it, let's so be it. Let's humble ourselves. Would you stand to your feet? And we're going to sing this song. And this song is titled, We Fall Down. And uh, it's that, that posture of humility before God. And, and uh, we've already taken up the tithes and the offerings. It's a uh, few minutes before 12. We're going to sing this song. We're going to allow God to let something happen in this place. There's not going to be necessarily a formal dismissal. Um, I would ask before you take off that you at least wait for the song to be sung a few times. Um, but we're just going to let God do something something in our hearts, do something in this place, I'd encourage you to take a posture of humility before the almighty God who is already here and present in this place. And I believe that something is about to happen. Something great is about to happen as we posture ourselves before him. Lord, we come before you today in this place, Lord, a humble people. Lord, some of us humbled be because, Lord God, uh, well, all of us, because, Lord, we realize that you are greater than us, you are bigger than us, you are God, and we are just your servants. And Lord, we come before you as a humble people because, Lord, we realize today that there are many things in our lives that have been wrong, things that you call sin. And Lord, those things, sin, make us unworthy to be called sons and daughters of God. They make us unworthy to deserve your love. And Lord, we come humbly before you today because you loved us so much that you made a way for us, that Lord, you came because you loved us so much. So we're humbled, Lord God, as we realize how much you love us and how much you care for us and that you are our redeemer and that you show up and you want to bless us, Lord God. And, and Lord, I, I, I pray today that as we sing this song, Lord, that we would take a posture, most importantly in our hearts, but maybe even physically, Lord, we take a posture of humility before you and say, Lord, you are God, I'm not. Your ways are higher than my ways. I may not understand them, but Lord God, today I trust you. Today I bow before you. Today I humble myself before you. And Lord, I ask, Lord God, that as we humble ourselves before you, that Lord, things would begin to happen things will begin to line up in our lives as we humble ourselves before you as your servants, Lord, serving other people, Lord, would great things begin to line up in our lives, Lord God, that we would begin to see the Redeemer at work. We would begin to see the promises in your word at work. We would begin to see the blessings aligning themselves in our lives. And Lord, even when we start, Lord, maybe as Ruth, Lord, maybe poor in spirit, maybe broken, Lord God, maybe desperate, Lord, and we start in that humble place, or Lord, whether we start as Boaz, prosperous, Lord God, already in positions of influence, Lord, already having success, as success in our lives, Lord, I pray that all of us, no matter where we are in the process, Lord God, that we would still be humble, that we would still be your servants, still recognize all that we uh, have, all that we do, Lord, is only possibly possible because of who you are and what you allow. Lord, today we fall down and may something begin to happen, something great today begin to happen in our lives. In Jesus' name.